your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. This session, and you should have a handout in front of you, entitled Justification and Sanctification Issues, a Synthetic Discussion. Synthetic is not intended to be like a, uh, uh, an antonym for organic. That's not what I mean. What I mean is we're pulling together um, a whole bunch of stuff. So we're, we're synthesizing uh, whole concepts, uh, passages of scripture, theological ideas, uh, words. We're going to pull it all together. Or if you want to chop down to one more level, this is where I get to ramble for about 50 minutes about stuff that I've been studying. Uh, I have been fascinated with uh, the concept of, of justification and sanctification uh, since I went into the ministry. I guess I've been doing it now for like 33 or 34 years. And uh, this began as a project that, I, that was in, intended to be a serious study of the field about 10 years ago. Uh, it has just, just in the last couple of weeks, actually been finished as a manuscript and it's, it's being published as part of our Solid Rock Ministries. It will be available, hopefully online for free download soonish, and it is available, it will be available for our, our uh, Striving for the Mastery conference coming up in May for free giveaways. So this is uh, uh, justification and sanctification, but looked at uh, through maybe slightly different angles than we're accustomed to looking at it. So I'd like to introduce to you the concept that there are different kinds of righteousness discussed in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, uh, we see throughout this whole passage, uh, say, say for example, verse 17, uh, Romans 1, 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The righteousness of God is the ultimate standard in the universe. Uh, he, his character of uprightness, uh, uh, the absolute integrity and squareness of his character is the standard in the entire world. Uh, the, the goofy illustration I use is a carpenter's square or a machinist's square, and you can, you can buy from Lee Valley Tools or Bridge City Tools uh, a, a square that will cost you $100 or $150. And their claim is we have such precise CNC machinery that we can guarantee that this square is square to 0 .001 of a degree, uh, one one thousandth of a degree. So is that a perfect square? No, it's not. In fact, the only perfect square in the world exists only in the mind of the designer because there is no machinery, there is no human that can actually manufacture a perfect square, but God is. God is the ultimate standard for all conduct, for all motivation, for all thoughts, for all relationships. He is it. And so his righteousness is absolute and it is perfect. It is immutable. However, go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. And in Matthew 23, uh, here is the Lord Jesus. And if you look at verse 27, Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you to appear, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. There is such a thing as an outward appearance of righteousness, but an inward uh, horribleness, inward uh, sin, inward hypocrisy. So we're calling this hypocritical righteousness. And there certainly would be a lot of people who would fall into that category perhaps even within the body of Christ, that there would be people who, who could fit that characterization. Uh, look at Luke chapter 1. I'm talking now about a, a, a conformity to a standard. Uh, and so in Luke chapter 1, please look at verse 6, Luke 1, 6, speaking of Zacharias and Elizabeth. 
it says in Luke 1, 6, they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. What does that mean? Does that mean that Zacharias and Elizabeth were sinless? Certainly not. But it means that when they sinned, they followed the prescription of the law to make sacrifice, and they walked according to the, the, the laws of God. Does it mean that they, they didn't sin? No, they sinned, but they made it right. So we, we could say, we actually could use this when we talk about unbelievers, when you talk about your next door neighbor, and you say, well, he's a decent guy. Do you mean that he's going to heaven? No, you don't mean that at all. You mean uh, he doesn't uh, blow his leaves onto your lawn in the fall. You mean that uh, he doesn't have five junk cars on blocks in front of his house. You mean that you know, he's, he generally doesn't throw his trash into your back. He's a nice guy. He's decent. He conforms to a generic standard of some kind. Uh, so this, this would be uh, conformity to a standard. Now, none of what we've looked at so far in terms of human righteousness is what we call saving righteousness or justification. The two forms, hypocritical righteousness and conformity to a standard, do not qualify for that. However, go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians, the third chapter. And look, please, at verse 8. <clears throat> Here's the Apostle Paul. Philippians 3 and verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Verse 9. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. That's what we are just talking about, conformity to a standard. Not that, he says, but continue the verse, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is imputed righteousness. This is the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to someone who believes in Jesus as Savior. This is saving righteousness. This is where we have the robes of Christ put upon us and our filthy, sin-laden robes placed on him at the cross. This is imputed righteousness. And notice uh, Paul specifies here and elsewhere, there is one and only one means by which a person obtains this kind of righteousness. It is through faith. Only through faith, nothing else. That's what the Bible teaches. So this is saving righteousness. But now, but now, there is a fifth kind, or if we're talking in terms of human beings, there is a fourth kind, and I'm calling it the fruit of righteousness. So right here in Philippians, uh, look at chapter 1 and verse 11, please. Philippians 1, 11. In fact, we'll pick it up in verse 9. Philippians 1, 9, to grab the context and this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Incidentally, at the end of verse 10, day of Christ seems to be one of Paul's ways of talking about the Bema. That's probably the Bema. And in verse 11, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness. Now, what is that? What is the fruit of righteousness? Why does, why does the New Testament use that language? Uh, is it the same as imputed righteousness? Well, if you back up through the passage, verse 10, verse 9, we're proving the things that are excellent, uh, we're being sincere and blameless. Verse 9, our love is growing or abounding more and more in real love and, and knowledge, discernment. So is this faith? Well, faith doesn't actually make an appearance here. This is not believe in Jesus and you receive righteousness as a gift. That's not what this is. This is the development of character. This is growth. Is there a kind of righteousness that grows in us? 
as we walk with God. Look at uh, uh, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Mark, yes. Uh, so the, the wording is, it's a genitive, fruit of righteousness, and it, it's probably describing what the fruit is. So the fruit is itself righteousness. Yeah. In Hebrews chapter 12, please look at verse 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. There it is again, fruit of righteousness. In this text, what is it that is producing the fruit of righteousness? God's discipline. Is that the same thing as believe in Jesus and receive righteousness for salvation? It is not. There is no hint here of faith in Christ and you now have eternal life. This is God the Father disciplines his children. If you respond the right way, it will cause righteousness to grow like fruit in you. Look in James chapter 3, James 3, and take a gander at verse 18. This is the wisdom passage, and in verse 18, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In the context here, it deals with, with uh, wisdom. Wisdom is expressed in various virtues and characteristics, and there's a connection between wisdom and the fruit of righteousness. Uh, NASB is a poor translation there, the seed whose is not in the text. It's just the fruit, the fruit of righteousness. That's James 3.18. So allow me to suggest to you that there are, uh, there are actually different ways of looking at justification and sanctification. There is such a thing as positional sanctification. Uh, one of my favorite places to go is 1 Corinthians 1 2. Don't turn there now because we're, we're flying. But uh, you are called saints. And he's writing to, to the church at Corinth. Come on. Holy ones. Uh, the list of problems at Corinth. And, and Paul says, You have been called, designated saints you got to be kidding me. That is one of our official labels. When we trust Christ as Savior, we get the label saint. Now, for the rest of our lives, if we take Christianity seriously, we're going to be trusting the Lord and working at growing to be worthy of that label. But we have the label. A guy who comes through boot camp uh, and is given the, the rank of private U.S. Army, has he been in a, in a foxhole in combat? No. Has he fired his rifle in anger? No. Uh, has he uh, faced enemy fire and, and been willing to protect his buddy? Not yet. But if he's an honorable soldier, he will seek to be worthy of the uniform and the title. We have the title, saint. Progressive uh, justification runs parallel to that. It's not talking about the position I have as justified. That's the imputed righteousness of Philippians 3. And you can find it in Romans, and you can find it in a lot of places. And it is a marvelous doctrine. It's the bedrock of our faith. I am right before God because of the righteousness of Christ. When I believed in Jesus... I received a, a, a white robe. When God the Father looks at me, he sees the white robes of his own son and not my filth. My filth was placed on Christ at the cross. That's why he was judged. That's positional justification. But there is a progressive justification. So now let me do this with you. Think with me. Uh, about metaphors that the, the New Testament would use for sanctification. What are some of the analogies or allegories or metaphors uh, that the Bible would use when discussing the Christian life? Let me give you a few to think about. <laughs> 
So you have constructing a building. Can you think of any text that would talk about the Christian life as building a building? Ephesians, First uh, Corinthians three. There'd be others too. Even uh, Sermon on the Mount, the, the foolish man, the wise man, rock and sand, building a building. Or how about uh, the growth of a tree or plant? Related metaphors, bearing fruit, wheat and tares and. Uh, agricultural, horticultural kind of things. But it's expected that the crop grows up, the tree grows up, and then it begins to produce fruit. Uh, how about a journey, a path? Uh, you guys remember peripateo? Peripateo, to walk. Your walk a very normal sort of a metaphor for what you do. You get up and you, you begin your day or you, you, your journey through life, your walk. Um, how about oops, how about everybody immediately thinks of Ephesians 6, that's an important one. I would suggest to you that there are others that are probably equally important. I think that there's a few in, in uh, 2 Corinthians. Uh, one of my favorites is 2 Corinthians 10, talking about siege warfare, uh, bringing every thought into captivity under Christ. Or uh, the, the metaphor of the soldier in 2 Timothy 2, the, the characteristics of the Christian soldier combat it and it's in many places in the New Testament. How about running the race? Uh, can you think of some places like that? First Corinthians. Hebrews 12. Uh, there's another one of those in Second Timothy. Uh, and, and so on. There's, there's a lot of those. Growth to adulthood from uh, infancy to a solid <coughs> adult. Passages. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, classic. And there'd be others. Or learning, discipling, following a pattern. So now, uh, here, here's something else. I, I've worked on this, and this ties in. Again, remember that since I labeled this a synthetic discussion, I've given myself permission to just kind of wander around. So here's, here's something else to ponder. Uh, think for a moment, take the, the analogy of the path or the road or the journey, and think about a road that has guardrails. And in our walk with Christ, we're supposed to be growing and developing. We're supposed to be going in a certain direction. But sometimes it is possible that our, our growth is not consistent, our path is not straight, and we actually begin to bump into the guardrails. What are the guardrails and what is supposed to happen when we begin to do that? Well, let me give you some thoughts. Uh, the, the Word of God is, I think, probably the primary guardrail of the Christian life. So what can happen when a, a believer begins to wander out of the path in reference to the Word? What, what is supposed to happen? This is where you talk. So the word of God is going to start disciplining you in, in what ways? 
conviction. So you're reading, you're having your devotions, and all of a sudden a nail gun comes right out of the Bible and hits you right there. And you realize, I am out of line. I, that, that thing that I did, or that relationship that I started, or that habit that I've got, or that neglect that has taken hold, it nailed me. And what's supposed to happen next? Confession. I say, Lord, I, I am out of line. And you just showed me, thank you, and I agree with you. That's, that's sin. And then you begin the process of getting back. What might be another manifestation of this? The word. The discipline of the word. The guardrail of the word. The, the preaching, I, the primary, I, I think, um, and guys, we ought to preach for conviction. We ought to, we ought to preach to, to, to make people feel bad. That ought to be a part of what we do with our ministry, the preaching of the word. Uh, how about if somebody has gone just a little farther down the road and their vehicle is actually scraping against the guardrail, the word of God has shot several bullet holes, but they're not responding. Surely, uh, God's discipline. But in reference to the word, could it be possible that I'm having my de uh, devotions, but it doesn't mean anything to me anymore? I, I, I read it, whatever. And if I go far enough down that path, why bother with devotions at all? Why bother with sitting under the preaching of the word? Well, you see where that goes. In that case, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stepping over the guardrail. I'm starting to wander farther and farther away. And, and God doesn't like that because he's a loving Heavenly Father. He wants us back. And it could result in uh, our dad, Dr. Ken Brown, used to talk about the three phases of discipline. Uh, the word, the woodshed, that's Hebrews 12. Can you guess the next one? Frank knows the wooden box, what's that? 1 John 5, the sin unto death. I, I think that's probably a pretty fair appraisal. So the word. Now think for a moment about prayer. How can prayer function as a guardrail for the Christian life? Confession of sin. Certainly confession of sin and the awareness there, I'm out of sorts. I, I'm out of step. And my, so, so in practical conversation with somebody, Pastor, I feel like my, my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. Now, that could just be a feeling. It could just be, you're wrong. Uh, you, you know, your feelings aren't right. But what could it be? What you pray for? My will over God's will. This person is out of step, out of sync. There's sin unconfessed. He's not actually in fellowship with the Lord. And the feeling that his prayers are bouncing off the ceiling is real. That's a real thing. Because God is not answering his prayers. He's out of sync. And so if we in our own lives or working with our church family, we discover, I feel like God hasn't answered my prayers in six months. Okay, well, uh, where are you in your confession? Are you, are you, do you have short accounts? Are you up to date? And if the answer is, well, there might be a few things. Let's talk about that. Prayer acts as a different kind of guardrail in that if I'm praying properly for you, I'm going to be involved more directly, which would be a correction to you. So let's, let's take Ralph's, uh, a comment there and go forward with it. The next thing on the list is body life and fellowship. What's that? <clears throat> so what is supposed to happen in a church family when members of the church see another member rubbing up against the guardrail or they've stopped and they're standing still and they're looking over the guardrail down the embankment and they're looking down and saying well 
looks like it could be fun down there. What, what is supposed to happen? <laughs> we come alongside and we say, what are you looking at? Uh, what is over there that you find so fascinating? Uh, the road is this way. The, the, the path is over here. You're, you're looking over there, and I'd like to tell you, I've been down there. It may look good from this angle. When you get down there, it is a swamp. It is mud. It is bugs. It, it stinks. You can't get it out of your shoes. Don't go down there. In fact, if you let me, hook your arm and mine. Let's get back on the path. Should that be happening in local churches? How much? All the time. All the time. That is one of the guardrails of the Christian life. Now, we have to be really careful, don't we? This is not nosiness. This is not busybody. This is not, I know better than you. This is not, I'm much more experienced than you, and you're just a babe in Christ. That's not what this is. This is, you're my brother, you're my sister. Standing at the guardrail, looking at the swamp is not a good idea. Because the longer you stand there, the better it looks to you. It's not. I guarantee you it's not. Let's get back in the center lane. Let's get back in the path. I'll help you. This is supposed to be going on all the time. Is it just the pastor? And I'm convinced that you yourselves are filled with all goodness, able also to admonish one another. One another. Is it just the deacons? No. It's supposed to be the entire body. I know that it's supposed to be the entire body, but um, I've had church members do some of the dumbest things to people. Yes. Like, now you, you should let them do this, but they, I know they need to be trained, but they, they said some zingers. I had to go patch it up. Yes. So there's somehow in here, there's a, there's a balance between... Uh, Church members are supposed to be growing into maturity. They're supposed to be developing adulthood. They're supposed to be, be becoming disciple makers. But at the same time, you have, you have a warning. Let not many of you be teachers. So I think that there, there must be a very strong teaching element, a very strong example at, at the top, and, and leadership that's going to set the tone and help and, you know, a Christian ought to have a heart of compassion, but he or she must also realize when they're getting in over their depth and that past, uh, past or more, more mature Christian could step in and help. But, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. Galatians 6, yeah. Okay, so the word, prayer, body, life, and fellowship. Why did I put music? on that here here's you pastors you who serve you who help out on the platform i think you can relate so you're on the platform preliminaries announcements uh offering and you're singing hymns and you're you're communing with god you're asking for help in your sermon that's coming up in five minutes but you're singing you're singing hymns and you're looking out and you're kind of scanning your church family and you see somebody who's not singing the hymn. Why aren't they singing? They usually sing. They, they, you know, it's a little weird. There have been a couple of times when I have felt so strongly about this that I actually followed up on it. And I went to a brother and I said, so-and-so, uh, I saw you weren't singing today. You always sing. Is there something wrong? And it turned out there was. Why would that be? There's a connection between spiritual health and singing. Think Ephesians 5. There's a, there's a relationship between where I am in my walk with the Lord and my desire to have godly Christian music in my soul I can't carry a tune in a bucket, but I love to sing. And if I stop singing, well, it's 
for one of two reasons. One is because I'm about to lose my voice and I have to preach in three minutes. The other is I can't sing this because I'm not sure that I'm qualified right now to sing what this song says. Music. And how about emotions? What are emotions supposed to do? Okay, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Uh, you know, the, those great big highway trucks, uh, snow plows, and those have those, those wire things that come off the, the bumper, usually front and back, I think. You know what I'm talking about? They're like wire rods. And I asked a, a highway guy one time, why do you have that? He said, well, it makes a horrible noise when you get over close to the guardrail. Emotions are designed to be warning lights, uh, idiot lights on your dashboard to tell you, hey, you're out of oil, or hey, your tire is flat, or hey, you've lost all the coolant in your engine. And it's supposed to tell you something's wrong. I am angry, or I'm really, really sad, or I feel guilty. Well, again, you know, feelings can be wrong, and so uh, if somebody comes to me and says I feel guilty all the time, uh, you know, we might talk about, well, why? You know, if, if you have trusted Christ to save you, you don't have to carry guilt around. And it could be just a feeling, but it could also be doing what it's supposed to do, which is to make you feel terrible. Uh, and so uh, emotions can be a guardrail. So now let me show you this next piece. The normal restorative pattern of the Christian life. What, what is supposed to happen? In our lives, we sin, we make mistakes, we get messed up. God knows that, and, and he designed this in, into the Word of God, into the, 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 the Christian life. And uh, you cannot find all of this in one passage, but again, I'm synthesizing. Uh, here's what it seems to look like. Conviction. Uh, conviction is not necessarily just a bad feeling or a feeling of malaise. Uh, conviction, as defined by the Bible, is, is most often a pointing out. That's what the word means. A pointing out of a problem. Who does the conviction? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts. What is the normal expected response of the believer who is a little messed up but, but you know, wants to grow? Uh, genuinely desires to serve God and love God. Well, the expected response is First uh, John 1, 9, right? We confess our sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the next thing that's supposed to happen, when the Holy Spirit shows me, Lawrence, you did this, and it was wrong, I am supposed to say to God, you're right. That is what confession is. Confession is to agree with God about my sin. I say to him, yes, you're right. And it was me. I did it. Nobody made me do it. I did it. And I'm accountable for it. And when we do that, when we agree with God, he, he clears it up. But there's more. Uh, after confession is supposed to come repentance. Repentance. What is repentance? Let me give you a couple of options. These are popular views of what repentance is. To feel really, really sorry for your sins. If you, if you could put a sorrow meter on somebody when they're repenting, it's, it's redlining. It's, wow, I'm sorry, but I'm really sorry. Is that what repentance is? What, what, anybody remember the Greek word? Metanoia, oh, meta, uh, metanoia, metanoia is the, the noun. Uh, meta, change, uh, noia, thought, mind, mentality. I like to call it a change of mentality. It's not just a change of thoughts, it's a change of mentality. And so typically, repentance would involve at least three areas in which my, my thoughts or my mentality has changed. 
it would involve my thinking about sin. And five minutes ago, I thought that that sin was okay or even fun. That sin was fun. Or it, it doesn't bother anybody. Maybe it's not the greatest, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt anybody. But when I've repented, I think about sin. That is awful. That's terrible. Why did I ever think that was good? That, that's horrible. It stinks. What was the matter with me? That sin is terrible. It's not a fluffy plush toy. It's, it's cancer cells. It's coronavirus. Uh, it, it's terrible. Another area in which I would have my mind changed would be about me. What would I have been thinking five minutes ago before I repented? What do you think? Before I repented, in relationship to myself, what was I thinking? I'm in charge. I make my own decisions. I'm my own boss. I make up my own mind. I do what I want. I'm a good person. Uh, I'm the big cheese. After I repented, now what do I say? Lord, I'm really small. I don't deserve a thing. You don't, you're, you're under no obligation to do anything nice for me at all. And I am a wretch. And I, if, if you give me the privilege of serving you, that is the greatest thing in the world, to be your servant. If you'd let me do that, I would be all over it. And a third area in which I change my mind is about God. What changed when I repented from what I was to what I am now? What happened in my, in my thinking about God? How big is he? Well, five minutes ago, uh, he's, he's really big. He's like a big grandfather in the sky. And uh, he, you know, he's pretty nice. But I also have my own will and, you know. So, so how big is he now? Way bigger than that. Way, way bigger than that. How much does he own? Well, five minutes ago, he owned a lot. But there may be little closets in my life that are mine. Keep your hands off. That's mine. Now, what does he own? Everything. Uh, it, five minutes ago, I might have been thinking, I'm not sure that everything that God does is good. I, you know, in my personal experience, watching life, watching my own life, watching the lives of people that I love, Lord, I'm not sure that that was the best choice for them. I'm not sure that what you put them through was really, really, that was five minutes ago. Now, what am I thinking about God? You are good, good, good. You can't do anything bad. You can't. What you're doing and your character is good. It's good. And you're in charge. So, repentance there's one more thing. Take a look in, in uh, Acts 11.21. This is fun. Acts 11.21. I dare you to preach a message on this verse. Acts 11.21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The verb, the last verb in that sentence is epistrepho, turned. It's, they converted. Huh? Now see, when we talk about conversion, what we're usually talking about is salvation. Somebody converted. But that's not really how the New Testament uses the word. Conversion has to do with 
the habits of life and with the soul and with what you do and, and your activities and, and the course of your life. It kind of has the idea of a, a, a wheel revolving around, turning around. And it has to do with believers deciding with God's help, I'm going to go in a different direction. So it's, it's more than repentance. Repentance was your worldview, your, your mentality. Conversion is, it's now my life. I'm living it out. Notice a large number who believed turned. A large number who believed, they're, they're Christians. And then they got converted <laughs> after they believed. So here's the normal trajectory of the Christian life. Consistent, slow, and steady upward growth. This would be analogous to the fruit of righteousness. This would be growing in holiness. This would be sanctification. This would be increasing in Christ-likeness. Really, it's, it's pretty much what the whole New Testament is. In fact, it's really pretty much what the Christian life is. In fact, it's really pretty much what pastors are supposed to help people to do. We're supposed to aid and assist our church family to move ahead in their holiness, in their Christ-likeness, in their sanctification, in their progressive justification, in, in their uh, move from infancy to adulthood, their move from barrenness to fruitfulness, their, their growth, their path, their, this is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to help Christians grow in sanctification. Now obviously, Matthew 20, many other places, we are supposed to have the heart of an, of an evangelist and we ought to take every opportunity and we ought to look for opportunities, we ought to make opportunities to share Christ, of course. But the whole New Testament is largely about sanctification, edification, growth. Uh, here's another interesting thought for you. Look, take a look at 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. I have come to really love 2 Timothy, the second chapter. There's just a whole bunch of stuff in there that's a lot of fun to work through. So I'm in 2 Timothy 2, and look at verse 22. Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace uh, with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And I actually wanted the preceding verse, verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he'll be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Sanctification is the preparation for service. Sanctification is how we get ready to do stuff for God. Uh, the way that I like to put it in this passage is talking about vessels, vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. And the way that I like to, to put it is, uh, you know, you, you, if, if your wife is not feeling well and you're going to fix supper and you're going to do a casserole or quiche, ah, wait, wait, real men don't make quiche, right? I will so, <laughs> all right, so, so we're, we're going to take it up a level. It's her birthday, and we're going to make cheesecake, okay? So you go, and you're hunting around the kitchen for the appropriate dish to put the cheesecake in to bake it, and you're look, looking around, and you, you come across this one dish in the back corner, way, you know, the, the cupboard where things just kind of land, way back in the corner, you reach in and pull this out, and... What in the world? And then you remember, Uncle Joe came for a visit last summer. Uncle Joe chews tobacco. And he said, hey, I, I left my Coke can out in the, in the truck. Do you, do you have anything? And you found an old flower pot or whatever. And, you know, he's talking. And Howard likes this. He's, he's going with it. So here's the thing. You're making cheesecake for your wife. Do you use the spittoon 
or do you find a clean dish? God is extremely happy. He actually specializes in using cracked, chipped, crackled, glazed, old, dented pots and pans. He likes it, but he doesn't like to use a dirty one. Sanctification is the preparation to be useful to the master. So, real quick like, in three minutes and 14 seconds, I'm going to tell you about keys to sanctification. And I'm going to give you a secret. Would you like to know the secret to sanctification? I have I've been studying this pretty intensively for 10 years. And I will tell you the secret to sanctification for yours and for brothers and sisters in Christ. Are you ready? I'm going to lay it on you. There is no secret to sanctification. I myself have thought for a long time, there's got to be some passage of scripture that, that I have to find. I have to exegete it just right. There's some word. Or maybe it's a certain kind of prayer. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm not praying right. Or maybe I need to have this spiritual discipline in my life. Or now, don't misunderstand me. Certainly, proper understanding, proper hermeneutics, proper exegesis, prayer life, all of that is very, very important. But if you have a balanced diet of preaching the Bible, if you have a balanced diet of reading and thinking and meditating on and obeying the Bible, you are being sanctified. You are on the path. There is no secret. There is not one passage that you go to and you say, this is it. This is the one. No. Now, having said that, I do think that there are some keys that somebody who is growing in Christ ought to understand. There, there's some key concepts that are pivotal and a, a Christian normally growing from infancy to adulthood will find these and will incorporate them. So here they are. I've list, listed them for you. Faith. Faith is absolutely critical not just to get saved but to grow in sanctification. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me you can do nothing. We, we, Hebrews, we have to believe God not just to get saved, but to grow, to operate as a Christian. We, we, if you don't have this, if you're not trusting God, and friends, you, you understand what I'm saying, we, we fail. <laughs> this is an area where we, we read the Bible and we say, well, it says that God is working in me. I don't see it. I don't think it's happening at all. But do we believe what we think, or do we believe what God says? Faith, we, we have to believe. Secondly, there's this matter of cleansing. There are, there are a couple of really, really interesting verses. Let me show you one where we're at right now. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 21, did you catch the opening line? Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, cleansing. The idea is of ritual purification. Maybe we could uh, paraphrase it, scrubbing. There is, and it's, it's, uh, it's confession, but it might be something like confession on steroids or take the next step. If you find a root in your life and you've confessed it, but maybe there's something more, a pattern of sin or a tendency or a proclivity, we need to cleanse ourselves. Notice that we cleanse ourselves. This is something that I do with God's help, but I have to do it. The word, John 17, 17, what's it say? Sanctify them in thy... Exactly. The, the word is truth. The word, I like to call it the matrix. It's the medium. It's the medium of growth. It's the area in which growth happens. And growth is not going to happen if you're not in the medium, in the matrix. Obedience. It, it may well be, it's possible, that this word, obedience, could perhaps 
hold together a huge clump of material. Actually, at the end of the day, after, after 10 years of wrestling with this stuff, you know what was running through my head? Trust and obey. <laughs> we believe that God is who he says he is. We believe that God is good. We believe that he's at work in our lives. We believe that he has all power. We believe that, that he's operating in our, in our lives and, and helping us to serve him and love him and grow. We believe that. We trust. And then when we find in the Bible that we're supposed to do something, we don't argue with them. We don't disbelieve. We don't back away from it. We say, okay, I'll do it. Trust and obey. 